honorable members, when the business of the House suspended, uh, we were at appointment of select committees on the order of business. The Chair recognizes the honorable member for Angleston. <coughs> Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise on behalf of the people of Angleston, and I believe concerned Bahamians everywhere to move for the appointment of a select committee. Mr. Speaker, the appointment of a select committee is a proven and invaluable tool for parliaments and legislatures worldwide to investigate and inquire into matters of public interest and public importance. This member was privileged to chair a select committee several years ago, appointed by this parliament to look into and inquire into the allegations of sexual misconduct of a teacher in Eight Mile Rock who was accused of sexually abusing several male students at that school. The committee comprising members from both sides of the political divide submitted a report to this parliament and as a consequence of its findings and recommendations, there was a change in the policies and procedures in the Ministry of Education for the vetting and of, of teachers, and in particular, international teachers. New policies were initiated to protect children in such circumstances and, avenues for, and new avenues for reporting sexual misconduct. The teacher, on the other hand, a sexual predator in our public schools, was convicted and is very likely poised to be deported from our country, if not already deported. So it tells you the value of a select committee. Today, Angleston moves for a select committee to examine all matters related to the proposed OBAN project, to review the circumstances with regard to the signing of the heads of agreement, and to review and to inquire into whether the tabling of the agreement dated the 19th of February 2018 constitutes an intentional misleading of the House with power to send for persons and papers, with leave to sit from place to place, and with leave to sit during the recess. This motion, Mr. Speaker, comes in response to the very many concerns, apparent irregularities, the unanswered questions and inconsistencies, the concerns nationally about what has now come to be called the Oban deal. These, scores, these, these concerns are underscored by the peculiar provisions of the heads of agreement, the incentives and concessions, including a commitment to come to this parliament and change the terms of the Industry Encouragement Act, especially for Oban, a first since the law's enactment in 1970, almost 50 years ago, and the grant of what amounts to a 99-year lease of hundreds of acres of crown land, including a right of first refusal for an additional 500 acres for no apparent good reason. Mr. Speaker, this government promised greater transparency, particularly as it relates to heads of agreement and deals struck with foreign direct investors. Indeed, its, in its apparent fervor for these principles can be seen as the Prime Minister travels around the world, articulating his pure commitment to these values. So we'll be interested to see what the government does in this debate. Mr. Speaker, I believe Many, if not most of us, agree in this parliament that the Bahamian people have become wary of deals struck by successive governments which are perceived by our people as putting our people in an in inferior position at the bargaining table. Negotiations which are signified by huge concessions to the investor and costly commitments by the government with no appreciable cost-benefit analysis. These concerns are inflamed when, as in this case of the Oban deal, there are so many red flags being raised. I trust that we in this place know and understand that the Bahamian people are no longer prepared to sit quietly and accept these disproportionate arrangements and now expect, indeed, demand a more enlightened approach to these arrangements, so important to our economy and the well-being of the Bahamian people. Mr. Speaker, the Bahamian people yearn for new paradigms in our economic model, one which places into the hands of the Bahamian people a larger, more meaningful, indeed a significant share of the economic lifeblood of our country. It is a fundamental component in our quest 
for national identity and individual self-fulfillment. Much of what we see and know, and which is the source of great frustration to the Bahamian people, is founded upon historic and structural inequities which have been perpetuated over the many years and have plagued our people in our forward development. Some, fun some fundamental steps have been taken to reverse or correct these imbalances in our social and economic life. For example, in the post-1967 strides in access to education, including tertiary education and access to universal health care, among other things. We saw it, for example, in the enactment of the Movable Property Act, which sought to end the historic land grabs by foreign interests and to provide for a more rational land use policy in our country, and in particular, land use for foreign direct investment. This important intervention, the Movable Property Act, which sought to redress the historical imbalances was subsequently revised and repealed and replaced by the International Persons Land Holding Act 1992, which to a large extent reinstated the prior destructive course of virtual, uncontrolled, and unrestrained land alienation to foreign sources, thereby driving up the cost of land and causing for land ownership for average Bahamians to be practically unattainable, and in addition, to the alienation of thousands of acres of land forever out of the hands of the Bahamian people. In the current investment model, I, I'm wondering if Carmichael could not interrupt. You'll get your opportunity to speak. In the current investment model, do you want to speak? Does a member want me to merge to, to yield? Who would yield? No, I won't know. I, I didn't know. I didn't know I woke up, Carmichael. No, I won't know. Let, let, let them speak to, to just get to the debate. You have the opportunity to speak, Carmichael. That's why Carmichael put you here. Mr. Speaker, in the current investment model, I'm speaking for Angleston right now, please. Speaker, in the current investment model with foreign direct invest investors, Bahamians are gravely concerned about the level of concessions being accorded to these investors. And if you, if you disagree, let us know. Especially when weighted... Speaker, I wonder if, if East Grand Bible, this is about you, you know. It's your constituency. Okay. Then let us, let, let the people hear. I said successive governments. <laughs> and Bahamians everywhere. Well, you know, if the member of parliament does not stand for them, I will be happy to do that in this house. Okay? Yes. Speaker, with foreign direct investments are gravely concerned. And, you know, the people take it very lightly. You know, I want the Bahamian people to see how trivial these people take these, these things, Speaker. Speaker, they're gravely concerned about the level of concessions being accorded to these investors, especially when wait. Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering, is, is, could you stop the time, please? I'm saying for the Speaker. Wow. I'm being disturbed. <laughs> speaker, uh, uh, Speaker, I am being disturbed by the man. This is a, this is a, a, a debate for select committee. Okay, no problem, no problem. No, if this is the way, then, then you come, we'll do the same, no problem, Speaker. About the level of concessions, Bahamians are concerned about the level of concessions. Uh, uh, honorable members, Mel Feingerson has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bahamians are concerned, in case you don't know, about the level of concessions being accorded to these investors, especially when weighted against projected benefits of the relevant investments. Bahamians are fed up with the failure to provide and deliver on realistic and compelling cost-benefit analyses to justify these generous concessions, including valuable land resources. And more and more our years. people feel as though they are being positioned by governments in a place of gross disadvantage in these transactions. Mr. Speaker, it is intolerable, Speaker. The Oban deal has, in this regard, captured the imagination of the Bahamian people, unlike any other foreign direct investment in the recent history of our country. This deal, this Oban deal, has touched on every one of these sensitive points and has aroused in the Bahamian people an alarm about the adequacy of skill and prudence that is being applied in the management of their affairs by this government, Mr. Speaker. These sensitive points touch and concern the long-term alienation of crown land to foreign entities. They touch and concern serious questions about land use and concerns about the destruction of the environment and quality of life. Issues including sound futuristic policies on green energy and climate change and sustainable development. 
They concern the bona fides of foreign personalities who label themselves as investors, but are often described as coming to the Bahamas with briefcases filled with hot air and very little else, and subsequently creating the unfortunate impression of a gullible government or, at worst, suggesting the undue influence of officials in critical decision making. This Oban deal has raised many very serious questions which cannot simply be explained away as, quote, unfortunate missteps or, having, or as having, quote, the heart in the right place but the head wasn't working too good at the time. The questions raise very serious issues which require a deeper probe for substantive answers, hence this, mo this motion today. And speak, I don't want the other side telling me who do this and who do that. We are dealing with the Oban deal right now. We don't need political deflection. We don't need to have a 20 years ago and 40 years ago and 10 years ago. We are dealing today with this Oban deal. We want accountability today, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, <clears throat> the Oban deal has been touted as a $5.5 billion deal to implement and construct an up to 20 million barrel multi-purpose liquid bulk facility and a 250,000 barrel per day oil refinery in Hereditament, situate in East Grand Bahama. The most disruptive member here right now is East Grand Bahama, Mr. Speaker. East Grand Bahama. I want the Bahamian people to know it is East Grand Bahama which does not want this aired, it appears, yes. And to, ex to construct the privately owned housing for sale and rent to Bahamian citizens for rent only to non-Bahamian citizens. The government has yet to formally disclose the said hereditaments or the land involved in this deal, which are only generally described in the agreement as, quote, crown land and, quote, seabed. The lands were required by the very agreement to be specifically identified by exhibit or plan attached to the heads of agreement. To date, which has not, which has not yet been done, because the agreement has been laid in this parliament, and they have not complied with this critical mandate of the agreement. It was left for the Bahamian people to learn from Oban executive Satpal Duna, assuming his, assuming his information is correct. We don't know. This is how we learn about what lands in, our land is involved, who disclosed in a recent public meeting in East Grand Bahama that the site of the refinery and storage facility will be, quote, and I'm quoting Mr. Duna, because the government has not told the Bahamian people where this land is. He said, Mr. Duna told us, that the land is two miles east of Stad Oil, which is in the East Grand Bahama. He's reported in the Nassau Guardian as stating that the land, and I'm quoting, is a narrow corridor running from the beach to the main road and slightly above it. He said the crown land is a nice piece, this is where it is a nice piece, of 690 acres of land. The narrow corridor is really just for the pipe corridor to move product in and out. The actual terminal refinery will be at the rear end away from the seas. This is the first specific description as to the location of the crown land, which is being divested in this deal for a period of up to 90 years, in effect for generations, by crown lease. Assuming this information is correct, and of that we are still not certain, this lack of proper disclosure and failure to be transparent on the part of the government of the Bahamas is a grave dereliction and is inexcusable. This is a source of serious complaint by Bahamians in general and everywhere, but also to the Bahamas National Trust, which has management responsibility for national parks in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, and them in particular, which opined that they were only able to garner some kind of guidance on the land's lo general location by going onto Oban's website. And I will explain later why the BNT's, Bahamas National Trust role is so important in this matter. They didn't know either. No one, we'd be hearing, be hearing from Mr. Duna. But immediate and serious questions are raised about this Oban deal on scrutiny of its principal players. In light of what has now been uncovered, much to the credit of serious journalism in this country, real questions are raised as to why this government has seen fit to proceed with this transaction when prior administrations refrained from doing so. It cannot be enough for the Prime Minister to say prior administrations performed due diligence, as he has been apt to say, and which only serves to create a red herring. And we can listen to this debate and we can see how much red herrings are thrown out. We're talking about Oban today. Mr. So speaker, the question is why previous administrations, why previous administrations never 
I don't care what videotape you bring of someone, a senator in, in, uh, on, a, on a location. Why previous administrations never proceeded with, it doesn't matter who it is. The question is this, why previous administrations never proceeded with this investment, including a prior administration in which the now prime minister served as the cabinet minister for health. Yeah, but yet, this People's Time administration has made a determination to not only enter into a heads of agreement, but to provide significant concessions, including the generous allocation of hundreds of acres of crown land. Mr. Speaker, our first encounter with Oban in the public domain comes in November of last year, when one Peter Krieger, then described as the managing director of Oban, participated in an interview with Tribune business editor Neil Hartnell, who along with Travis Cartwright Carroll of the NASA Guardian, have done a significant amount of very useful and enlightening re research on this matter. In that interview, Mr. Krieger, Krieger boasts of the benefits of this oil refinery to Grand Bahama. He speaks about the local partnerships they have created, the contracts he claimed to have entered into to purchase private land in East Grand Bahama for its housing project. He claimed in November of last year to be wrapping up the environmental impact assessment, which he said would be completed in three to four weeks, which we now know was untrue, as this claim was again repeated in February, three to four weeks. In November of last year, Mr. Krieger spoke of meeting with government officials, including the member for East Grand Bahama, the Deputy Prime Minister. That's what he said. It is this same Mr. Krieger, who was seen on the 19th of February 2018 on national television and on Facebook Live, sitting in the cabinet office of the Bahamas next to the Prime Minister, who, which we now know, was signing someone else's name at an event which was represented by this government to be the formal signing of the heads of agreement with Oban. At or shortly after this event, Mr. Krieger was no longer said to be the managing director, but was now being described as the non-executive chairman of Oban Energies. But, was it, but it was only after the antecedents of Mr. Krieger were revealed and his signing of someone else's name was discovered that the event witnessed by the Bahamian people was no longer being described by this government as an official signing, but was now being cast by the Prime Minister as a ceremonial signing of the heads of agreement for a $5.5 billion oil refinery and storage facility in Grand Bahama. As to these antecedents, it was revealed that Mr. Krieger had previously pled guilty to the first degree felony of organized fraud in the United States of America in 2006. According to a document in the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, their website, um, on, on, and on November 6, 2006, Peter Krieger pled guilty to the first degree felony of one count of organized fraud in obtaining property valued at more than 50,000 in violation of the section under the Florida statute. The document said, according to newspaper report, that on November 6, 2006, the same court entered a judgment in the criminal case against Peter Krieger based on his plea agreement. The court, and I'm quoting from the, re the, the report, the court sentenced him to seven years of probation, during which he may not be associated with or be a broker, dealer, or investment advisor, and to joint payment with Sheldon Krieger, his father, of $1.2 million in restitution and fines and payment of $7,373 in costs. The count of the criminal information to which Peter Krieger pled guilty alleged, among other things, that from March 2000 until approximately January 2001, he engaged in a scheme to defraud and obtain money from investors in the KFSI fund or clients of Krieger Financial by false representations or promises. The SEC also brought a civil complaint, which alleged that from June 1999 to December 2000, KFSI, the same company, quote, misappropriated more than $3.7 million of investor funds. The matter was settled in 2007. The complaint alleges that Peter Krieger used a company corporate credit card of which at least 527,446 KFSI fund money was used to pay the balance for more than 160,000 for personal items such as dental visits, taking his pets to the veterinarian, designer clothing, jewelry, 
and high-end home entertainment. It was further revealed that an action was brought against Mr. Krieger by BAICO, the Bahamas-based judicial manager associated with the CLECO proceedings in our own country, and that's a topical issue right now as we speak, where it was alle alleged that BAICO invested $10.25 million with a U.S. fund, Coban fund, for which Krieger was the director of operations. A lawsuit was filed alleging that $8.7 million was transferred from the fund's account in 23 different transactions to accounts belonging to Krieger and his wife. The claim was dismissed on the basis of being statute barred, and the merits or otherwise of the case were never aired. With these surprising disclosures as to the dubious professional dealings of the face of Oban, Mr. Krieger's role rapidly evolved in plain view of the entire country, from being managing director to non-executive chairman to what he described himself as ambassador. As efforts were, were underway to distance Mr. Krieger from the heart of the Oban deal. So this is, where, this is how we are now formally introduced to this, this deal. Indeed, the Prime Minister advised this parliament that effective March 2018, Mr. Krieger resigned from the company. However, though, despite the Prime Minister telling this, us this, the Oban website displays a document dated March 9th, 2018, signed by Mr. Krieger, eight days after he purportedly resigned from the company, which announced that Oban Energies was created on March 3rd, and then all of these announcements under the hand of the man we were told in this parliament, in this country, was no longer associated with the company, and he was announcing the new leadership of this company. This shifting leadership in Oban has been described as a virtual corporate musical chairs. To some of us, it, appeared as if, it appears as if Oban is making it up as it goes along. At the signing ceremony, which went from official to ceremonial, it was this Mr. Krieger who sat in the cabinet office next to our prime minister for the whole world to see who purported to execute the heads of agreement a signing that was forecast by the Prime Minister in this house five days earlier when he announced the signing of the Heads of Agreement. When the antecedents of Mr. Krieger were exposed and the close-up shot of a Guardian cameraman disclosed his signing of another man's name on that document, we were then advised by the Prime Minister that this was a mere ceremonial signing. At no time prior to this, was this described as a ceremonial signing. And in fact, the Prime Minister informed this Parliament that on that date, the actual heads of agreement would be executed. Again, we, were, we are left to wonder if we are witnessing things made up as we go along. In a subsequent communication to Parliament to explain the discrepancies, the Prime Minister then for the first time advised members of this Honorable House that another person, one Sat Puldona, the same one who told us where the land was, that he signed the heads of agreement on the 10th of February, four days before he, he announced this in Parliament. So when the Prime Minister told us he was going to sign it, we now learn afterwards it was already signed. Mr. Donner, he, Mr. Prime Minister advises, signed on the 10th, on a Saturday, with no apparent witness to this signature as appears on the document. The Prime Minister then laid on the table of this House a document dated 19th of February, when Mr. Dona himself admits he was not even in the jurisdiction. Because the Prime Minister advises, and I'm quoting him, the government decided to date the agreement the same date of the ceremonial signing. The Prime Minister has yet to lay on the table of this Parliament the second document, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister notes that Mr. Dona President of Oban arrived in the Bahamas on the 6th of February 2018 with the expectation of signing the heads of agreement on the 7th of February. He represented to the parliament that it is not unusual for heads of agreement to be signed before a ceremonial signing so as to ensure there is a firm agreement between the various parties. It will be interesting to learn of previous cases where this has happened. And I've served twice in the cabinet. The Prime Minister says it's not unusual. He claims, and I quote, in recognition of this promise to keep the Bahamians informed, this is what he's saying now, in recognition of the promise to keep Bahamians informed, 
the government arranged a ceremonial signing. So he did this for us to inform us. A ceremonial signing on the 18th, 19th of February. However, it was never disclosed as a ceremonial signing. And this revelation only came after the expose by members of the media that the PM had been sitting with him, the persons with the antecedents of Krieger. Krieger. And the importance of this more than anything, Mr. Speaker, is it appears as if the government is making it up as it goes along also. Oban is doing it, and the government is doing it. And we, we already know that, on, that as it relates to Oban, that we have to have concerns about the credibility of the players in that, of that organization. It's the antecedents of the persons being described. You want me to drop the bomb? Okay. Described as the president of Oban, Mr. Sadpul Dunno which also raises concerns and compounds anxiety. The Bahamian people are interested, if you're not East Grand Bahama, East Grand Bahama, but we're doing a select committee and I'm putting the case together. So, you know, but you don't need to worry about that. You don't need Freetown, you don't need to worry about that because you argue for whose vested interests you are married to at the appropriate time. The Sadpul Dunno. <laughs> Speaker, Mr. Sadpul Dunno. <clears throat> so, Mr. Speaker, what? What's unparliamentary about that? That's what he said. He said at the time he was talking for, for his board, his, his board president. Yeah. Speaker, Mr. Sadpul Dunham. See, and this is what we're dealing with, Mr. Speaker. This is what we're dealing with. Mr. Sadpul Dunham also raises concerns and compounds, compounds anxiety about this investment. First, it seems he has no experience whatsoever in this field. According to Tribune Business, his biography describes him as having served as managing director of a company called Credit Sites. That's what he said. But according to the newspaper article, Credit Sites was contacted, and they said this claim is not true, that Donna never held that post, but was simply a director in one of its corporate offices, and who was later dismissed in 2010 for, quote, alleged gross misconduct. The article detected also inconsistencies and inaccuracies in claims by other members of the senior management team, which were found to be untrue, including the listed senior vice president of Oban, Russell Erickson, and its finance man, Mark Michel. In the case of Erickson, <coughs> it was claimed, discovered, that what was claimed in his biography was a completely different story after cross-referencing. In the case of Mitchell, who was apparently self-described as a managing director of Drexel Hamilton Investment Bankers, it, discovered, it was discovered that he is not the managing director, as he claimed, but a director at the financial institution or what they call a structured management team. Further, the CEO of the engineering firm, Tex, Gert van Meijeren, which has been identified for front-end work in the construction of the terminal, was, according to research of Tribune Business Editor, previously head of another company called CTS Middle East, which, quote, fell foul of the U.S. authorities for breaking its trade embargo with Iran, for which the company was fined 48000 in plea agreement. <clears throat> Again, in the case of Mr. Van Meeren, he conceded that an Oban advert, quote, oversold the stature of his company. Know what I'm saying now, Mr. Speaker? You are having now a very deceptive group of people who have come to the table with this government. And th this, is, this, is what we, uh, this is the, the point we're making. They say they they don't hear this before, but the Bahamian people won't hear it, Mr. Speaker. They bring a very deceptive group to the table, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Speaker, pardon me? Listen, man, you know, Mr. Speaker? We're waiting on the punchline. Mr. Speaker, what half an hour? You gotta be joking. Uh uh. One hour, my brother. One hour. <coughs> so, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker? And so, you now have this deceptive group of people with these very dubious backgrounds, criminal backgrounds to a large extent. Some, one or two of them. They've lied on their, on their bios, and, um, and this is who we are now, this government is committing hundreds of acres of crown land 
in this country, and we're going to get to the land. But I want to make the point. See, they, they're making plain noise. They say the PLP bring them here. And all, PLP, and nobody struck a deal. This came to Ingram. And minister, the prime minister sat in that cabinet, and it was, did not go through. But in the people's time government, so this is what we're dealing with, the Speaker. Yeah, the speaker, <coughs> then we heard the Speaker, the website, the website for Oban. So you got these dubious characters in terms of their, what they claim they are and who they really are. The website for Oban also appears to be a revolving door for claims and assertions, deletions, and amend amendments. One day information's on the, on the website. The next day the information is, take, is, is taken off the website, Mr. Speaker. In truth, Oban seems to be making it up as they go along, even with, it seems even with the collaboration of our own government, Mr. Speaker, because they're aware of these things. And they will come in here and they will make an argument for the Bahamian people to settle for this, Mr. Speaker. Despite claims by the Prime Minister uh, as to the track member, record. Um, yes? Um, be careful with that road you're going on now because you're imputing some improper motive without substantiating it. Well, I, I said it looks like they're making it up as they go along. I thought I, 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 that's what I'm saying. That's how it appears to me. It appears as being made up as it goes. No, you get one defense and they come with a new argument, Speaker. You, you, so made, that, you, you made a statement with respect to the government corroborating. Making it up as they go along. No, the statement with respect to the government corroborating. Yes, with them, that, making it up as they go along. But, but you, did that, and the government it's is improper it for you to suggest mm -hmm. that there was corroboration. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, to me, it, it appears to me that they seem sympathetic to um, these shifting arguments. In fact, they're advocating these arguments in this parliament, Mr. Speaker. They seem to be sympathetic to it. Personally, I, I, I would have expected a much firmer response from the government with all of these. Um, I, I'm assuming people made misrepresentations to the government. I don't know. We have to find out. This is why we have the select committee. I would assume that they would have been a lot more firm on these things, but they seem to be coming with the new arguments as they go along. Mr. Speaker, I, can I get to the body of yes. the Yes, carry on. Speaker. <coughs> Speaker, despite claims by the Prime Minister as to the track record and experience of Oban <coughs> in major construction projects, where he advised that an Oban management team, and this is what the Prime Minister told us, has been largely, um, has been involved in large en energy infrastructure projects around the world, and this is the Prime Minister tell telling us this, and brings over 30 years of large complex construction experience it is not clear whether this is in fact so. What is clearly missing with this company is any prior experience or expertise in oil refineries. The ambassador, Krieger, explained Oban's role as this, and I'm gonna quote him. He says, it's much like being a general contractor in the sense that if you're building a hotel, you might own the hotel, but you bring the, in the Ritz-Carlton or the Four Seasons or the Hyatt, and they actually flag and run it and they have experience and deep bench of personnel to do something. It's very similar in the energy industry. So he's not claiming to, they're not claiming to have any background in this area at all. They liken it to the hotel where they build a hotel and then they go out there and find the talent. And this is what Oban is telling, has tell, told the Bahamian people through the media. <clears throat> and then he says, we are currently talking with many major internationally recognized energy firms that we will bring on board and we'll be making some exciting announcements in the near future here. This is what he told the Tribune business section. Business section. Additionally, there appears today to be no readily available funding for this project. Now, unless there's been a breakthrough, I know I've heard some this, that, and the next thing. And we question whether Oban is in fact using the valuable assets provided by the Bahamian people, namely the Crown Land, the seabed lease, and a slew of peculiar concessions as the apparent chip to raise funding. In light of the dubious reputations of the individuals populating the leadership of this company, and I want to reiterate that, Mr. Speaker, dubious reputations of the individuals in leadership of this company have gone through it. <coughs> this is unheard before. But it's very serious. Very serious. You can't, the, the, what is, who leads this company? When you look at that, Mr. Speaker, and you look at, when you look at the rapidly shifting roles, the fake signing, the conflict of dates, the self-contradiction, the rampant inconsistencies, 
the questions raised on the face of the document laid in this parliament, the unprecedented nature of the, these states of affairs. I've never seen a foreign direct investment project to be so assailed by these types of negative characteristics of the speaker in the history of this country. Never, speaker. Serious questions are raised which must be answered for the Bahamian people, not through trite political platitudes. We don't, the Bahamian people do not want to know, Mr. Speaker, what the PLP did 10 years ago, or what the FNM should have done, and what they, they're not interested in that, Mr. Speaker. What they want to know is, they want to know about this Oban deal, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> and so, Mr. Speaker, it requires a thorough airing, and no one should object to this. A thorough, I, 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 I come, Michael also reminds us, fair-minded people should not object to this. He always reminds us, you cannot, if you, if you object to this, then you, you ain't on the right track. And no fair-minded people, now you might, you always, no, 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 I, I always listen to you. Give us some advice. I always listen to you. No, no, the, yeah, I, I, I've been here a long time, I get advice, and you need some advice? Speaker, and how the, 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 they, the speaker, we want to, it requires a thorough airing and investigation of the surrounding facts as how these individuals got through a vetting process. How, without having any experience in the field, and apparently a still unresolved funding issue of $5.5 billion deal, how did they achieve to get a green light in this, ma in this manner? Why were they ultimately deemed suitable to become investors in this country and to qualify for generous grants of crown land and other valuable concessions, including compelling a government, this is what they put in the agreement, to come promptly to this parliament to change a long-standing law, especially for Oban? Speaker, this parliament must now, in its own interests and in the interests of the Bahamian people, conduct a full, free, and fair investigation into the circumstances surrounding this deal to a procure a full under understanding of what factors informed and or influenced the decision-making of this government. And it is not the, just the dubious personalities which have seemingly combined in this Oban deal, which raises serious questions about this government's motivations and reasonings for its decision-making. But there is great concern of the terms of this heads of agreement, which themselves appear to be a major departure from the standard norms in such agreements, in, in particular relative to the protection of the environment in foreign direct investments. The inquiry arguably begins at the removal of the best commission from the portfolio of the Minister of the Environment without public notice, other than the apparent erroneous gazetting, which effectively and apparently in error, stripped the minister of all of his portfolios with, when the intent was to remove the best commission only from that minister's portfolio. During the settling of the heads of agreement, the best commission fell within the purview of the prime minister. The environmental provisions that are of primary concern are set out in clause five, which seeks, quote, to box in the government to timelines giving the government 60 days only to review, 60 days only, to review the environmental impact assessment. And if the government fails to provide its comments within that time, the EIA shall be, quote, deemed acceptable, whether it is in fact acceptable or not. So listen to that now. This government signed an agreement to do this major, massive, environmentally implicated project and say, if we don't answer, if the Bahamian people don't answer in 60 days, it will be deemed to be approved. This is how they boxed in the Bahamian people in this very serious way, Mr. Speaker. It is important to note, on the other hand, Oban is given great flexibility. This is the other side of the coin. We got 60 days. But Oban, and I didn't, I didn't tell you about Oban, we done, the Bahamian people have all heard about Oban, their leadership. They have been given great flexibility in their timelines. Clause 5 provides that even if the government determines that any aspect of the development cannot be implemented in an environmentally safe and sustainable manner, that's what it says. They have that in there. The government, this is what they say, shall not have the right to terminate these heads of agreements based on the EIA report 
but instead shall work with the developer to mitigate any concerns. And then there are other provisions in the agreement which seems to bring up the balance of it. But I, w I am shocked that this government would agree this government would agree to anything in a document that would resemble this, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, you want me to go through it? Clause 5 2, the agreement. No, no, I, I'm, I'm, you, no, you, no you, read, you read what you have, Mr. Speaker. You read what you want. Speaker, <coughs> they give them 30 days and 30 days to sign off on the environment management plan. So we, they gave us 60 days and 30 days, but give the foreign investor of this dubious background with no money so far as we know, all of this flexibility in the agreement speaker. The developers on the other hand can refuse to carry out com any commercially reasonable measures, but instead retains the right to abandon the proposed development. And let us hope that if they do decide to abandon it after they've dug up East Grand Bahama, that they have not done significant harm because there is nothing in the agreement that requires remediation if they pull out under that clause, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, it is very possible that due to the capping of the cost of an environmental expert at 130,000, that the, the, the Bahamian people may end up fo footing a substantial portion of the cost for environmental oversight of this major and complex project. Liability of the developer is capped at 3.5 million, regardless of the nature and extent of environmental degradation. Speaker, it's important to determine whether as a result of these peculiar environmental provisions and the portfolio shift of the best commission, whether the usual and standard environmental protections have been compromised to the prejudice of the Bahamian people. It is important for the Bahamian people to understand why the Bahamas has, through the terms of this heads of agreement, expressed in ways that put the, uh, the, the why this heads of agreement is expressed in ways that put the Bahamian people in an unequal position with this foreign entity. I am offended, and y'all should be ashamed of yourselves to agree to something like this. Sit around the cabinet table and agree to something that even gives. This sort of impression that we are an inferior people, Mr. Speaker. The Bahamian people must also understand why this government has seen fit to approve an oil storage. You only act for the Bahamian people. You're not gods. Get that in your head, man. You only act for the Bahamian people. The Bahamian people must also understand why this government has seen fit to approve. Well, get up and say you don't think you're God then. Oh. <laughs> I do take offense that the Honourable Member for Engleston will say on her feet in this House that, I don't speak for the others, but for me, that oh. I think I'm God. No, I didn't say I that. Take I you say you over there <coughs> think you're God. No, I, I, I take offense at that, and I wish you to withdraw it. What I say, I'm speaking, I was responding to someone seated on, over there on, who said, on, on. no, speaker. I did on. not say God. I said God's. Gods, it's a terminology which says you believe you have, have a higher thing. I, I would I, I, I would draw it, Mr. Speaker. Seems I seems I would draw it. <coughs> Speaker, I do so in the interest of preserving my time. Because I see I, I don't want to get distracted. I just want this government to know that they are trustees. They are trustees. You are not subject to no higher law. You are trustees on behalf of the Bahamian people. And in this deal, you have been found wanting in a most disgraceful fashion, Mr. Speaker. By you, by you, Speaker. By you, by you. <coughs> Speaker, the, the Bahamian people must, uh, must also understand why this government has seen fit to approve an oil storage and refinery facility in this particular area of East Grand Bahama, where there are three major national park, protect, park protected areas. The Bahamas National Trust, have, having surmised where the, the, the area is, because they were never told, has expressed great concern about the location and cannot, and this is what they say, the Bahamas National Trust, there are three national, major national parks in this area, cannot envisage any scenario where it could support this project. They note it has been documented that all refineries, because we're talking about the oil refinery now, has um, poses a high risk of air, aquatic, and soil pollution. The Bahamas National Trust complained it has been kept in the dark. 
They say the three national parks are the Blue Canyon, the East Grand Bahama, the National Park, and the North Shore, the Gap National Park. Three ecologically important in national parks. The BNT, in a press release, the BNT knows where it is, stated it wishes also to note. No, I know where the land is, but I'm speaking, I'm speaking about the National Trust now. They are, they are. No. They said they found out, they say they found out from the website of Oban, okay? The BNT in a press release stated it wishes also to note that the facility advances the expansion of fossil fuels, one of the acknowledged greatest contributors to climate change. It is primarily environmentally, environmental safety concerns that has meant that no refineries have been built in the United States since the 1970s, albeit existing refineries have been expanded. The project would be built in an area located near Sweeting Ski, a series of tidal creeks that provide prime flats fishing habitats that support the local communities in East Grand Bahama. This is, this is, I am quoting from the Bahamas National Trust, Mr. Speaker. The trust also made reference to the extensive mangrove forest, the explored blue hole systems on Sweetings Key. The Lukayan National Park protects one of the largest charted underwater cave systems in the world, a unique system of elevated work caves to the last intact mangrove wetland on the southern shore of Grand Bahama. I'm quoting from the Bahamas National Trust, Mr. Speaker, because they are stakeholders. They say they speak about a magnificently, magnificently unspoiled beach and the tallest sand dunes on the island. The North Shore, the Gap National Park, the coastal area consists of mangroves, wet and tidal creeks, sand and mud, beach strand and rocky shores, and an extensive area of blue holes and pine woodlands. <laughs> That's coming from the Bahamas National Trust. Again, <clears throat> as to the environmental concerns, the director of the Bahamas Reef Environmental Educa Educational Foundation brief, Kev Serino, McKinney Lambert also expressed concern of what they described the potential impact of an oil refinery on Grand Bahama. McKinney Lambert told the Nassau Guardian, refining oil is a notoriously polluting industry as has been demonstrated to be the case in many countries around the world. This highly polluting industry is not compatible with our global image of being a clean, green and pristine tourism destination. We would like the Bahamas to be known as a forward-thinking country that is known for the sun and powered by the sun. The solar power technology is readily available and rapidly decreasing in price per kilowatt hour. And Grand Bahama is becoming increasingly recognized as a tech hub. Hon so Honorable this is members. a great fit. Speaker, I, I understand what they're doing, but the, the bottom line is they're talking to Bahamian people. So go, go, go full speed ahead. Speaker, given the fact, and this is from brief, it would be irrational and damaging for the country to move forward with this fossil fuel agenda instead of embracing solar power. You can imagine how you're embarrassing our Minister of Environment all over the world talking about climate change, talking about climate change and bringing this, uh, bringing what I call a, a stinking oil refinery and talking about oil refinery, uh, um, talking about climate change, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Y'all just a bunch of talkers, man bunch of talkers. Speaker, it's important to note at this juncture that the ongoing concern to the residents of Grand Bahama about the effect of industrial pollution, and this is a serious matter, on the health and well-being of residents. And there are concerns about the nexus between the pollution and other health issues and even death. And you know, I was in a meeting, and I got a couple minutes. It was in a branch meeting. And um, there was a young lady, I didn't know she was from Grand Bahama, and she was talking about the school that she went to in Grand Bahama, with proximate to the, this industrial type of environment, and how many, the stinking smell that drove the children out, how many of them, her peers, who were dead within a year or two or three, and she herself said that she had breast cancer in her 20s. There are real concerns for the people of Grand Bahama. You could laugh in this parliament all you want. You could heckle all you want, but there are real concerns in Grand Bahama about the, the nature of development and the impact it is ha having on our citizens. <clears throat> Speaker, a distinguished jurist and now public commentator, Dame Joan Sawyer has stated, and I quote, so from a personal point of view, I am concerned that you are going to put a refinery there. 
And what are the controls, statutory or otherwise, to govern emissions from any refinery, govern the purity of any product, govern the safety of the workers, govern the safety of the environment? What are the controls that are there for the Bahamian people and for our future? Can anybody point me to them? And like I said, I don't have a particular loyalty to anybody except the Bahamian people, end quote. That is from Joan Sawyer, um, Dame Joan Sawyer. When considering the, she's, a, she's a jurist. There's no laws. There's no protection in our laws. She's raised a very compelling point. When considering the clear unsuitability of this project in this particular area, and in this era of energy reform, climate change risk, eco-preservation, the risk to human well-being, it is necessary to put under the spotlight what would motivate this government. That's what I want to know. What would motivate this government to agree to such a project? We are, we are not comforted by the assurances of Mr. Krieger, who says our desire is to preserve the environment. It's critical and aligned to our, quote, integrity. Speaker, the land provisions in this agreement are also a major concern. Because as I, as I previously stated, the government has to date failed to formally advise as to where and how much Crown land is involved. As previously indi indicated, the executive of Oban inform members present at a public meeting in East Grand Bahama recently of what he says is the crown land involved in this project, which he described as being 690 acres. The heads of agreement, however, merely states that government agrees to provide a leasehold of land and seabed, crown land, which is not disclosed in the heads of agreement. Further, we see by clause 10.2, the oil refinery project also incorporates the housing industry with permission being given to construct on privately owned land and thereafter offer for sale to Bahamians homes. And the agreement clearly anticipates the involvement of non-Bahamian realtors playing a role in sales. And we recall the recent comments of the Bahamas Real Estate Agents, um, President Mrs. Wallace Whitfield, about the infiltration of foreign realtors into the domestic economy. This agreement appears to give the green light um, to such activity. Hon Honorable member, um, are, are you on a point of order? Yes. The chair recognizes this member for East Grand Bahama. To foreign real estate brokers and agents being involved in the, in the housing uh, uh, aspect of this agreement. And I just wonder if she can refer us to that, that section so that we can, we can uh, uh, um, verify it and see what, she, what she's referring to. Because as she just, as quite <coughs> rightly said, that the, in, the real estate industry is reserved for Bahamians. Uh, so I, I'm not sure where, where, that, where she got that idea in, in, in this agreement. Uh, and, and further, Mr. Speaker, the, the construction of, uh, or the construction industry is reserved for Bahamians uh, unless there's some, specif some uh, specialist skill involved. So um, again, if she can show us in this agreement where, there's some, where, where the government of the Bahamas has agreed for foreigners to build housing and to sell housing to Bahamians, um, I think she should withdraw it. Mr. Speaker, the, the member for oh, East Grand Bahama um, sits around the table, and this is his constituency, and he's being the most disruptive member in this house, I can tell you, sitting from his seat. But, Mr. Speaker, now, Mr. Speaker, let me just say this. Oh, I, I, I want, no, I want to, I, he, he didn't allow me to finish. The agreement oh, appears oh, oh, to give oh, the green light to such activity, even though, okay, oh, you know. Oh, honorable member. Speaker, can I finish what I'm saying? Uh, honorable Speaker? member, uh -huh. I'm trying to get a response to okay, the point of order. Okay, let me respond to it, because you know, the member should know. He the, sits around the table. The point of what order. What they've done, what they've done, Mr. Speaker, they have uh, uh, allowed foreign realtors to be involved in sales, but they have, uh, they are in the agreement, they says, but they must bring into the mix Bahamian realtors. It's not, it, uh, yes. On, yes. Uh, uh, honorable yes. member. Yes, it's in there. You have a deal? Uh, on, honorable member. You have a deal? The, the, the member for East Grand Bahama is requesting that I you My point time is not going, Mr. Speaker. You know, the, okay. the clock is... Um, Listen, man, y'all don't phase me in here. Get that in your head. The, <laughs> you don't phase me. The honorable Sorry. member yes, for East Grand Bahama is just asking to be pointed yeah, to... Yeah, I'm going to point it to him, Mr. Speaker. I'm trying to fight. You have it there? I think that he's asked me. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised and shocked. He sits around the table. You have it there? I can't find it. You have it there. You have it? Yeah, you have it, 
figure out the, um, threw me off because certainly I know the members should, no, 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 the member is quite aware, quite aware that it's in here, that they, it, it speaks specifically to foreign realtors and that they should be in, in insight or bring into the involvement of Bahamian realtors and I'm surprised the member is, uh, is suggesting that he has not seen that provision. I can find it. You find it? No, no. Speaker. Speaker, what I. No, it's gone where? Speaker. Honorable Member. Speaker. Let me put it on hold. Speaker, if the member is saying. I'm going to withdraw for the time being and bring it back during these proceedings. Okay. Thank you. 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 It's clearly there. I went through each clause in this agreement. I'm shocked. You should have done that. You would have stood better if you, if you would have fought for the people of East Grand Bahama. But you didn't. You didn't fight for the people of East Grand Bahama. Uh, 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 on a point of order, the, making a serious accusation, uh, and, and it is a breach of my privilege, to see suggesting that I do not fight for the people of East Grand Bahama in this deal or any other deal. And I take offense, and I ask her to withdraw it, Mr. Speaker. I'll withdraw. The people of East Grand Bahama will make their decision. Absolutely. I suggest you go and speak to them. And the people of the Bahamas. You're very passionate. Speaker. Go speak to them. <clears throat> and so, Speaker, I, I will withdraw the issue on the real, realtor and I, until I find it. Speaker, we also want to know, and we have not been told. Listen, I'm a Bahamian. I can speak with any rock or key in this country. Are you, you okay? Are you okay? You can't be okay. You cannot be okay. Honorable members. On you cannot be okay. Honorable members. Speaker. Please direct your comments you. to the chair. Speaker, would, would you would you ask the member because he's not allowed what he's doing? He's disrupting. Uh, the member the member for East Grand Bahama from his seat is deliberately disrupting, Speaker. And I am asking you to, to ask him to to to, to me. Y yes. Uh, uh, yes. Honor yes. Honorable member. People of East Grand Bahama will decide. The member for Angliston has the floor. <clears throat> and the speaker, I wouldn't want anyone in this house to suggest that there is a part of this country that I love that I am not able to speak to or speak about or go to. I, and I, 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 we're not in some, some exclusive club and you're speaker, I'm, we are Bahamians, speaker. Speaker, we also want to know, and we have not been told, not even by Mr. Donner, it seems, where is this privately owned land for this housing development? And this is what's piquing my interest. And who are the owners of this land? This agreement further anticipates acquisition of what are described as neighboring properties, defined as crown land, approximately 500 acres. See, the agreement ain't just the, the land. They, they got a right of first refusal for another 500 acres in this, in this agreement, Speaker. And the, the agreement anticipates that the government will be proceeding on an expedited basis. This is the language used. They use all this slavish language to the Bahamas <coughs> government. And they give the, these people, these Oban people, all these great, um, uh, more uh, lenient provisions in this agreement and put the Bahamas government and the Bahamian people in a straitjacket. I'm shocked that this government would sit around a cabinet table and agree to language, even in principle, to ever agree to language which suggests that, we, that any investor could come into this country and tell the Bahamian people that we are in some inferior position, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, this 500 acres, the government says that they will permit licenses and consents necessary to construct improvements on such neighboring properties. This is the 500 acres that they've agreed to in this as a right of first re refusal. Why is this government agreeing to a right of first refusal to Oban of an additional 500 acres of land, crown land, for no discernible reason that I can see? What is the rationale of the Bahamas government? What could be the ancillary or related developments anticipated on this crown land? Is this government's idea of rational land use development for generations of Bahamians yet unborn this? Is this what is their idea of rational land use in our country? And there were some over there who would have agreed with that, but you know, the air is different over there, Speaker. Has the government entered into a crown lease with a developer? as anticipated in Clause 13A, 45 days after the execution? We don't know. We don't know if they've signed anything. We don't know if monies have passed hands. We need to know what the facts are, and they should not be coming from a foreign direct investor, and in particular those with the credibility issues that, they, that this particular group has. The heads of agreement claims that the development will be, quote, in the substantial economic interest of the people of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. 
But this substantial interest has yet to be disclosed. They go in East Crompton with jobs, jobs. What is the substantial, you hear that word? Substantial economic interest of the Bahamian people. Is it just jobs? I mean, that, I need to know what is the formula now. Jobs? Yeah, we want jobs. But I mean, this is where the Commonwealth of the Bahamas has come now. This is it. We give away thousands of acres of land. We allow you to dig up our land, to pollute our air, and to cause health problems, and perhaps climate change issues, and then we can get jobs. Is that, is that what it is, Mr. Speaker? Speaker, is there a viable market for an oil I I refinery in the Bahamas? Has there been a market study? According to a Tribune article in the business section, the Bahamas oil refinery, Boko, explored the possibility of moving beyond its oil storage business into the oil refinery arena in the last several years, but decided the market could not sustain it. That's right there in Grand Bahama. And then they go further. Developments like this are also being discussed in the region with support Sir Paul Collier, a prominent Oxford University professor of economics and public policy. And he told reporters in Guyana, in the last week, an investment in an oil refinery would be an unwise investment for that country. Speaker, the whole oil, and I'm quoting, the whole oil industry is going to tether out in 2040, Sir Paul said. The world is going in a different direction. Y'all don't see it? And he told this to iNews Guyana, Speaker. You might be left with a great lump of, this is what he's saying, Guyana, you might be left with a great lump of technology off your shores which has no use. The British professor who was participating in a special high-level cabinet caucus on the development of the oil and gas industry in Guyana told reporters there the margin on the terms, he said, told the reporters there the margin on returns for refining oil is very small. The Oban Energies project should be completed, and this is the reporter saying this, Hartnell, by 2030. This is now, you got this analysis, nobody's going into no refineries. America ain't billing none, okay? And the market's gonna peter out. Borko say, we ain't gonna do it. The, this particular project will be completed by 2030, according to the heads of agreement signed with the government. 250 people are predicted, according to what they say, to be directly employed upon completion. By year four, the project should encompass a 250,000 barrel per day oil refinery, a component estimated to cost up to $4 billion. So by year four, you're talking uh, 2034, they're saying this is what will happen when the, the, the research is showing everybody else it can be petering out. We're just getting hot and heavy into it. Speaker, as to the recent findings, the findings of a fe feasibility study for the project have not been disclosed to the public. Added to these strange twists and turns, we are now learning that the best commission file has gone missing, and an investigation by the Royal Bahamas Police Force is now underway. As to the recent meeting in East Grand Bahama, it was reported by the Nassau Guardian that minutes after Oban Energy's president, Sadpal Duna, the same one who said he was this thing, and they say, no, you wasn't that, that ain't true. This person promised residents of Grand Bahama, his promise now, tell me the value of this promise that during its first town meeting on Thursday night, that moving forward, the company will consent, consult residents first. It was observed that Duna, this is a reporter saying this, shielded by private security, police officers and other personnel, so he left out there with big bodyguards, uh, who claimed uh, that he hon had a technical <laughs> meeting. Uh, honorable member. That night? Honorable member. Yes. Sorry? I, I was permitting you, Sorry? I, was, I was permitting you to proceed um, with respect to your references to mm -hmm. you got it? the Tribune business section. Mm -hmm. uh, um, <coughs> and now you are making references to another reporter's yes. story. Yes, I am. Are you adopting all I'm of adopting those? That. They, I, I am adopting his description of what happened after that meeting. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And what he said, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, he says that, um, he says that, um, all of the questions that they asked, they asked him about proof of financing, um, the technology to be used, how the company intends to deal with waste, and they asked all these questions of this man who just said on the, on the podium, I can be upfront and, and, and transparent. They, they said, each, this is what the reporter said, each of these questions was met with Donna's back as he swiftly shuffled toward an awaiting vehicle marked security with his entourage maintaining a barrier, end quote. <coughs> Speaker, and I'm ending now. We must be very wary in all the circumstances 
whether we will see open and transparent information flow from Oban. This is a major, major, major concern. And this has environmental implications, Mr. Speaker. The question we ask is, what is the compelling rationale which led this government to enter into legal arrangements with Oban with all of the character-related issues associated with its principles, the dubious career backgrounds, the absence of evidence of discernible funding, the lack of experience and expertise in the field of oil refineries, the absence of an economic impact assessment, at least none which has been disclosed. Was there a violation of our sovereign law by the government of the Bahamas as the member for South Beach told the Bahamian people? Did the government break the law in this transaction? Why are such significant parcels of Crown land on offer? Who owns the relevant private lands? Are there any relationships which might be inducing this project, political or personal or otherwise? When there is no other discernible rationale underpinning the decision making, questions must be asked. Why make irrational land use decisions in the heart of national parks? Why does the heads of agreement stipulate in Congress relationships between a sovereign state, the great people of the Bahamas, and a, and a proposed foreign investor? Was the now infamous signing exercise yet another fraudulent act? Where is the ceremonial document? Had the media not picked up on the fake signing, would this today have been a ceremonial signing? Had there not been a vigilant media, who or what is Oban really? Is there more to this than meets the eye? Because the fact defies sound logic. I'm just, I'm just finishing my last sentence. That is why, Mr. Speaker, that is why, Mr. Speaker, I, I can read it to him. I'm surprised he scrambled. He, he's, he really should not have gotten up. That is why this House must agree to a select committee. We must be seen to be upholding our solemn oath and meeting our sacred responsibility to the people we serve and our obligation to protect the patrimony of our people. Our people expect of us, people of East Grand Bahama, the people of West Grand Bahama, the people of Eleuthera and Exuma and Andros and Engliston everywhere, our people expect of us. And we are duty bound, Mr. Speaker, to do all things that are right in their interests for this generation and for generations yet unborn. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I want I, I have it here. This is um, the, I just, the guy, the, it's from the heads of agreement that was laid in this parliament. Yeah. But you, 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 you asked me a question. Okay. It's 10-3. Um, yeah. The developer shall ensure, shall ensure the inclusion of Bahamians in any real estate sales and operations and by listing secondary sales of the housing with independent Bahamian real estate brokers and whenever non-Bahamian realtors are involved, in the sales transactions, they will involve a Bahamian realtor, which is what I said. And I'm surprised East Grand Bahama, as yes, I did say that. No, I, I did not say that. I, I have it right here. No, Speaker, I'm, I'm, re Speaker, I'm, reading, from, I'm reading from a written script. Speaker, I'm reading from a written script. I, I don't want the members to say that. The members say there's no reference to foreign realtors in there. And there is. Yes, yes. You get, go and get it. I want you to get it. I want you to get it. I have it here. This agreement appears to give the green light to such activity, even though it speaks to partnering with local realtors. That's what That's I said. What you said. He said that. That's Speaker. She's right. Speaker, let me finish reading. He needs to withdraw now. Speaker. <coughs> so, Mr. Speaker, this, this, um, this clearly. Um, it speaks to, Speaker, this clearly Honorable anticipates Honorable the involvement of what they, well, I don't know if you, foreign may not be, non-Bahamian might be different from foreign. I don't know. Maybe that's what you mean. They speak about non-Bahamian realtors are involved in the sales transaction. They will involve a Bahamian realtor in accordance with the Real Estate Brokers and Salesman Act. Okay? Provided that the developer, I'll read it to the end, shall ob obtain all necessary permitted licenses to sell as developer, with some, that's an unrelated matter, and shall be permitted to sell housing which form part of the real estate inventory of the development. Right. I'm, I'm, qu I'm, I'm quite surprised. So, Speaker, I put that back on the record, that they have anticipated the involvement of non-Bahamian realtors, even though um, they speak about partnering with Bahamian realtors, Mr. Speaker. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Uh, um, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama. Mr. Speaker, the... the, 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 the the member is being uh, um, less than transparent yeah. with respect to this, Mr. Speaker, because the, the agreement, the, 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 the um, wording of the clause is very clear. It speaks to the developer 
who will sell the land to Bahamians. And it speaks to them uh, partnering or involving Bahamian real estate brokers as in accordance with the uh, Real Estate Brokers and Salesmen's Act. Yeah. It's very clear, very clear, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. So, so, you know, again, you, you, you got to be, you, you don't be disingenuous. And I didn't want to use that word. Honorable right? members. But don't be disingenuous. Right? There is no anticipation of any foreign real estate broker selling this land to Bahamians. None. And Mr. Speaker, just to, make, to, to, to further clarify, it is clear that the company had anticipated building homes in the East End area for the benefit of its non-Bahamian workers in the first instance, and as they leave, making those homes available to Bahamians. That was the idea. Because if you know anything about East Grand Bahama, you would know that we have a housing shortage. You would know that, particularly in this area, Mr. Speaker. Right? Now, the members already said what she had to say. So I don't, I don't know why she wants to mislead the Bahamian people. It's unfortunate. It's disingenuous. The member is, is manipulating the meaning of this. No, not at all. No, you're trying to man manipulate it. This is, Honorable, I want to Honorable members. We, 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 must, we must bring this to an end. the inclusion of Bahamians in any real estate sales and operations, and by listing secondary sales of the housing with independent Bahamian real estate brokers. And whenever non-Bahamian realtors, not the investor, not the investor, whenever non, I'm reading from the document speaker, whenever non-Bahamian realtors are involved in the sales transaction, they, the non-Bahamians, will involve, yes, whenever. Yes, that's going to happen. That, that foreigners will, will be involved, Speaker. And so I think that the member, the member for East Grammar, Speaker, needs to stop using these words like disingenuous and not all this kind of thing. Because the truth is, you are, you are actually um, becoming what you're saying or accusing others of. The provision is very clear, Mr. Speaker. Very clear. Now, I'm sorry you were not aware of that, but you should have gone through this with a, with a fine tooth comb, Mr. Speaker. You should have. Honorable, honorable, honor, honorable members. Um, I don't want to call it jazz, but it's uh, ascribing motive or, or lack of knowledge or all the rest of it. The fact of the matter is if she read the document, as she claims to have, she would understand that a lot of the things that she spoke about, even in her, even in her uh, um, uh, talk today, are not correct. Even when you talk about the environmental plan, you talk about the, the, the EIA, it's clear. It, it, the, the, the EMP is in it, the EIA is in it, it's clear. You know, only for people that seem to have a problem with this, honorable those members, who don't want to see development. Honorable, honorable members, I think we are a little pre a premature in our exchange. Uh, is there a second now? Yes. The, the, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Exomas and Ragged Island. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm delighted that the other side is now taking interest in this issue. Yeah. I'd become, <laughs> I'd become a little concerned at the beginning as they seem rather bored with it, and I suspect yeah, that they, they'd hoped, they'd hoped that the Bahamian people is also bored with the subject. You know something, tell me. But I, I, I want to, but I want to let the other side know that as I, as I travel around the Bahamas from Grand Bahama all the way down to, to Exuma, the Ragged Island, Bahamians are very much interested in the subject of the Oban Mata. Honorable members. Why are you sitting down, man? If it's Parliament, you better speak. Oh. <laughs> 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 Mr. Speaker, this is an issue about accountability and transparency. And this is why the Bahamian people are interested in it. 
And the second point I make before I begin into to my main comments is that as I listen to the heckle, it is clear that there's some difference in opinions on what the clauses mean and what they say. Uh. And this is why this select committee is important. And this is why I'm happy to stand to second the motion to call for this select committee to look into these uh, matters. I stand gratefully on behalf of the people of Exuma and Ragged Island, Mr. Speaker, the fearless people of Exuma and Ragged Island, to support the motion. But let me be explicitly clear up front that I fully believe that the Prime Minister misled the House of Assembly with regard to the Oban Heads of Agreement. I have said that outside the place, and I now say it inside this place. Yeah. I have laid out why I believe that, <coughs> and I have demonstrated proof of that only to be ominously warned by the Prime Minister to be careful. We live in a serious times, Mr. Speaker, and I am certain that the Prime Minister now realizes that as Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, his words matter. No longer is he on the campaign trail where they believe rhetoric would do. So the question for me, Mr. Speaker, is not whether the Prime Minister has mis misled this House by announcing that a heads of agreement would take place days after his announcement when he knew full well that one had already taken place, and afterward indicate he was tabling an agreement from the later date. Yet the Prime Minister subsequently admitted the heads of agreement he tabled was not the one signed at the press conference he announced it would be signed at. He has misled this House. I know it. He knows it. And the general public knows it. The questions, among many others to be answered, are why would, why would he mislead this House? And to what extent was this House misled? And then, what action should be taken for such blatant offense? under our Westminster system. I will further lay out the case for why a select committee of this House on Oban is necessary and go through in detail, some of it deserve repeating, why I say the member of Kalani misled the House. What I find curious is that the other side has been rather quiet on this issue. Even the most vocal, vociferous members have been quiet on this issue, like cat got their tongue, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> this state of quiet, though, has caused much disquiet in the public. Maybe the Prime Minister's ominously warned them as well. But what is it that we don't know, Mr. Speaker? What is it that we don't know? Uh, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama. The, the member just made a very serious statement. Very, uh, very serious accusation. That the Prime Minister has warned the public about speaking oh, about members, Oban? Members or, or members of this side. Or, 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 or members on this, on this side, Ominous. Mr. Speaker. Ominous. And unless he has some facts to prove such, he has to withdraw it. He has to. Uh, 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 honorable member for Speaker. Exomus. I didn't hear about the church, Mr. Speaker. My question was, my question was, Mr. Speaker, my question was, and, 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 and they have an opportunity to respond if they wish, but, but my point, my, no, no. Mr. Mr. Speaker, with, 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 Mr. with respect to the no, Mr. Speaker, point of order, let me finish, let me finish hold, hold on, honorable, honorable member, the chair wants you to, to address I'm addressing it. the I'm addressing it, Mr. The Speaker. point of order. Mr. Speaker, I'm addressing it. I haven't said anything yet. I haven't said anything yet, so, you, so Mr. Speaker, no. you don't know whether I'm addressing it or not. I, 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 I am satisfied that what you started to say was on a different course than but, addressing. But, well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, allow me to finish, and I believe you would be satisfied. My first commentary was that the Prime Minister ominously warned me to be, to be careful. And because there's been so much quiet, 
I question whether he is also one That's members on the other question. side. It's a, question. it's a question. Now they can answer it if they wish, but it's a question. What, what, what is it, Mr. Speaker? You, 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 got, you have to answer the question, Mr. Speaker, because you know there's, there's That's a shrewd in the in the in the in the in the the, the congeniality, congeniality of this place, from time to time, members may say something to to another in jest, off the record, and to suggest that somehow, the prime minister has given an ominous warning yes. to the member for Exuma, not the member for Exuma. I think is, is, is absolutely disingenuous. It is wrong. And I don't expect that from Exuma. I don't expect that from him. Because now, now, now we get to the point, Mr. Speaker, where we have to be careful what we say to each other in informal moments. You cannot bring those kind of statements into Parliament. What is that? You can't do that, Mr. Speaker. Otherwise, otherwise let's, let's, be, let's, let's be honest, right? We can all talk about things. We can all say things that have been said in private or that has been said in jest. You don't bring those in Parliament, right. Mr. Speaker. That is the, the, the statement that he's made that the, the Prime Minister has given him a warning, yeah. an ominous, ominous warning, yeah. and that he may have given uh, this side an ominous warning, has to be re re uh, retracted, Mr. Speaker. Has to be. Has to be. There, there's no way that can go on the record, Mr. Speaker. No way. What he's suggesting that the Prime Minister has done is, is absolute, absolutely it's despicable. Not it's despicable. You can't do that. No, no. You have to withdraw it. You withdraw that. Honorable Member. Mr. Speaker, I withdraw. I withdraw. I withdraw. I withdraw. But let, let me say this. The state of quiet the state of quiet on this issue has created a sense of disquiet in the public. Right. Now, what is it that we don't know, Mr. Speaker? I have a simple rule in business that if ever there's something that don't make sense, there's something that we don't know. I suspect there are things we don't know about this project. A project that won't be completed until 2030 gives no tax revenues, creates only a few jobs in 12 years, potentially poses a risk to national parks and wildlife sanctuaries to the point where the Bahamas National Trust says no way. There's no EIA, no funding, evidence. Now the file went missing from a commission under the direct purview of the Office of the Prime Minister. Now a matter for the police investigation. Several weeks now, no arrest, no charge, no report. Peter Krieger is, 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 is no longer involved, and the K Family Trust is now the new owner, according to the Prime Minister. But who are the beneficial owners of K Family Trust? Don't the Bahamian people have a right to know? That's why we're posing this, this uh, select committee uh, today. The Bahamian people have a right to know. After all, these are our business partners who we've given 690 acres of Crown land to, and we got no equity. This is what we're talking about. Oh, 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 honorable Member. The, the, any land to anybody. And he knows better. He knows better. You know, at the, at the best he can I, say. I, I the best he can say. No, I'm still, I'm, no, I'm still explaining. On, on, the best he can say is that the government of the Bahamas has agreed to lease. He agreed to lease. Yes. But he cannot say the Bahamas has given any land to anybody. That's disingenuous. Again, yeah. intentionally misleading this house. He's intentionally misleading this. He must correct me. Honorable member for Exoma. The government has agreed to lease. That's the 690 acres of Crown land and we got no equity. Mr. Speaker, that's, that's you know there's a, there's, a, there's a saying in the general public about throwing a rock and then if you, if you hit someone, you know. I don't, I don't want to. Mr. Speaker, I'm concerned that my time is being intentionally dwindled away by the heckling of the member of East Grand Bahama. And, and notably, Notab notably, notably, Mr. Speaker, you've given him incredible latitude today. And I hope, and I hope, and I hope honorable and I hope, member, and I hope, uh, honorable member, I, I, would, honorable I, would, I would draw, Mr. Speaker. Withdraw that statement, I would draw. please. I would draw, and I move on. And I, 
Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the member for East Grand Bahama is vociferous today, notwithstanding that he has been rather quiet on the issue. So on the question of good governance and accountability, Mr. Speaker, after having sat in the House for a year now and having been forced to listen after member after member talk about what the, the PLP uh, has done, it boggles my mind, Mr. Speaker, in many ways that the government cannot get the story on Oban Street. For people who love to call other people corrupt in this country, you would think that all the so-called facts would line up and there could be one traceable line from event to event. However, this is not the case. Mr. Speaker, the line should be linear, but it zigzags and it twists and it curves and it often disappears only to reappear somewhere where there was no line before. From the Prime Minister to the Deputy Prime Minister to the Minister of the Environment to the Attorney General to the Press Secretary to the Best Commission to Oban itself, no one can seem to give us one consistent linear story, a straight story on this issue. Thanks to this government, thanks to this government, we have, we have more questions than answers, and this is why we need this select committee. The Bahamian people in this House of Assembly have been routinely, routinely given different versions of this story, and now we have a right to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, Mr. Speaker. And worst of all, the Bahamian people, the Bahamian people anticipates transparency from the people time government as they promised. And yet, yet, Mr. Speaker, we receive a heads of agreement laid on the table, absent of the schedules. Yet, Mr. 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 Speaker, we hear a lot of, of half-truths logical fallacies, and we expect the Bahamian people to figure out, to figure out that, their, that their government is working on their behalf. And we anticipate the, that the public would weed through and swim through a whole heap of information that don't line up, shifting dynamics of the company that cannot be straight with such basic facts as who own it, who works, for it, who works there, what's their experience, and where exactly the project is going to be. It goes on and on and on, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am all for giving this administration the benefit of the doubt. But doubts about the intentions of this government regarding the Oban deal is heavily on the minds of the Bahamian people. And therefore, this select committee will help this government, no doubt, to ease the burden on the minds of the Bahamian people as to whether they are getting the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Following the instinct of the Bahamian people, the government has had three months now to bring clarity to this issue. Mr. Speaker, my friends on the other side should be warming up to the idea of accountability now to the Bahamian people after one year. Now after rising unemployment, the long stretches away from enacting a legislative agenda, uh, uh, undelivered promises, puffed up announcements on deals that don't happen. That is, that's the amount to very little, Mr. Speaker. After seeking to blindside us with a deal that clearly was not vetted, was not understood, and clearly wasn't appropriately crafted, it gives me great concern. I am concerned about the flipping and the flopping, the flimming and the flamming. The Bahamian people still interested in this matter and I know you're hoping are you hoping that the Bahamian people forget but this is actually going to be a load for you to bear for the next four years the Bahamian people actually want the answers and want results and want to see a government working on its behalf and that is accountable to the Bahamian people they find themselves aghast and taken aback by the Bahamian people wanting to have good quality information but after a year, we still find ourselves here. So why, Mr. Speaker, is this select committee needed? Lest we forget, Mr. Speaker, let me run down why there is such a dire need for this committee. Let me show the quagmire of web this administration has woven 
that it now finds itself caught up into, and I've said some of it before, some of it bears not repeating, but let's not forget on February 14th that the heads of agreement had been signed by a different man on February 10th. That announcement made, or did there, was there an intentional misleading? Let's not forget that point, but I will, I will skip that because we've extensively uh, dealt with it. But let's dig a little deeper, Mr. Speaker. On Thursday, March 1st, 2018, the member of Kalani tabled a document that he said was the heads of agreement for the $5.5 billion deal. And the member for Light Angliston laid out the questions of character in Krieger and South Powell Donor and how policyholders may have been disadvantaged in relation to the CL uh, Financial Company and Clico, et cetera. That bears, that bears not, that bears not uh, uh, repeating, though we knew none of that when this issue was presented to the House, except for the Prime Minister who said in this place days later, though not while on the floor of this chamber, that he was fully aware of this convicted criminal's past. Yet, he said so, yet he did not tell us. This is the same Prime Minister, the one who sat next to the criminal who signed the deal with our country, who loves to talk about what a corrupt place the Bahamas is. I believe, I believe, I believe he's put a 500, a $500 million, $500 million price tag on the country. $500 million price tag on the level of corruption. An arbitrary figure that he admitted that he heard somewhere. Well, I fully expect the Minister of Finance, when he presents his budget next week, to present a surplus. Because there is no corruption in this government. And if the number is 500 million, I fully expect a surplus next week. But I don't like to get into all of these corruption talk, you know, uh, Mr. Speaker. But Proverbs 23 is instructive. As a man think it, as a man think it, so is he. So, is he. so let's think clean and forward looking and progressive thoughts. So on the heel of all of this thoughts and talks of corruption, in comes Oban. Enters Mr. Peter Krieger, who has since admitted to his criminal past and apparently resigned from Oban, according to the Prime Minister, even though he's still making the annual filing and he's still the point man, he's still the point of contact, but we have no way of knowing this for sure unless this matter goes before this select committee. After that, after that, after that, Mr. Speaker, the filings, the filings are very clear on this issue. The filings are very clear. And I'm glad there's this agreement because it shows that the other side recognized the need to clear up this matter and therefore will vote in favor of the select committee. The media, of course, the media, of course revealed, revealed all manner of things, some mentioned by the member uh, from, uh, from Angliston. They mentioned that they had funding, they were going to present it uh, in, in a few days. It's now been in excess of 100 days, 104 days to be exact, and counting, Mr. Speaker. No one has produced an environmental impact assessment. No one has demonstrated proof of funding, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And the reality of it is we simply, we simply do not have any demonstration of performance even though this project has apparently been in the pipeline since 2009. This is why we need the select committee, Mr. Speaker, because we need to have the facts on this matter. No one, Mr. Speaker, has so far provided to the public a business plan for this company that claims it will grow the country's GDP by 10% per annum, while only adding 250 jobs to the economy over 12 years. No one has yet to explain where are these 690 acres from, where, where, where they are, except in the explanation proffered by, by Mr. Dunner. Mr. Dunner. Mr. Dunner went to East Grand Bahama, and he reportedly had a, a town meeting to bring some transparency uh, to the issue. Regrettably, the member for East Grand Bahama was presumably out of town, and therefore we only have Mr. Dunner's word to go on. Honorable member, um, uh, Chair recognizes honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I just want to, to clarify, uh, because the member seems to want to impute a motive. Um, 
the, as I have explained to my, my con constituents before and since, I could not make that meeting that was a no ban meeting and I could not make it to Grand Bahama because the member for finance and I had to travel to Europe for yeah. very important uh, national business as we are all aware in, re in connection to the EU blacklisting, Mr. Speaker. So, so again, you know, let's not, let's not you know, in, in try to, to, to infer these, uh, these, these negative connotations, Mr. Speaker. Uh, honorable member for Exuma. The, 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 I only made the point that the member for East Grand Bahama wasn't there. Yeah. And, and therefore, and therefore, we only have the explanation provided by Mr. Donner. The press said you were in Brazil, by the way, and not Europe. But I make the point you weren't there. So we, we only have Mr. Donner's word to go on. Though we know, what we do know, is that the schedules in relation to the Crown land and the location of the Crown land were not laid in this house. And Peter Mr. Speaker, it is no secret. <laughs> it is no secret, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> that a government, an executive, an administration, without civil and representative oversight, oh is a threat to democracy. Lucky and <laughs> is an insult to the democratic concept of checks and balances for an executive not to have to explain its actions to the legislative branch. And yes, Mr. Speaker, yes, we have questions. We have many questions. Why is it that the government insists on pressing head first with Oban despite the loud protests of outrage from even its own supporters. Why does the People Time government ignore the protests of the people they claim to represent? Is there, is there anyone on the other side in this place or in the other place who stand to personally benefit directly or indirectly from Oban? These are questions. And this is why we need to select committee. Honorable member. Honorable member. Um, your, your, your statement might be phrased in the form of a question, but it is imputing some improper motive. And, and um, um, if it, it is rhetorical in nature. Uh, and, and, and my estimation at the chair, it is objectionable. The way, the way you are putting it is objectionable. I have no intentions to, 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 to be objectionable, objectionable to you, Mr. Speaker. But, but, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my suggestion is only that the public has extensive questions about the Oban deal, and it's in the government's best interest to vote for a select committee so that these questions that might be perceived to be objectionable may be answered. There are more questions. Why is our Attorney General, the government's lawyer, providing a legal opinion in this agreement to Oban? I'm not a lawyer, but this seems unusual. It seems most, most irregular. And maybe we ought to have sight of that opinion in this select committee. These are questions. And how does the government justify an aggregate of 150,000 over 12 years for expert inspections? A sum of 12,500 a year cannot pay for the time even of the most junior engineer at the Ministry of Works over a 12 year span. Why did the government agree to do something highly environmentally sensitive and agree to waive its ability to cancel the agreement if there is breach. These are all legitimate questions. The Bahamian people want to know, did the government 
consider the health and safety issues given our experience with similar facilities around the world. And if they did not, is there a dereliction of duty? These are the questions that the Bahamian people want answer to. Why did the government agree to change any law or laws that might adversely impact Oba? Would the government re reveal which officer in the AG's office advised the government on this heads of agreement? Did the government in fact break the law? Did the government not comply with the Planning and Subdivision Act as suggested by a senior member from the other side who himself happens to be an attorney at law? Why? Why is the default of obligation clause found in section 16.2 why in that clause did the government agree that Oban have, don't have any right to do anything? Even though Oban set out what they would do, the agreement says that they have no obligation to do A, B, C, or D, and how will the government determine a breach under this section? It's very clear in 16.2 that the parties agree that neither the estimated investment in oil refinery or the terminal reference in the recital of this agreement shall be deemed to create or imply any <coughs> material obligations herein with respect to any specific investment by the developer, nor shall any provisions in section three hereof be deemed to create or imply any material obligation to the developer. Wow. That's incredible. Now that's a question that the Bahamian people want an answer to. Why does it appear that in the assignment clause found in 1710, that it's rather non-specific. Do we know who the intended parties are who will ultimately, uh, who will uh, ultimately um, own? Honorable member, the, the, the chair recognizes the honorable member for East Grand Baham. Yeah. Okay. 16, the end of 1662. You okay. need to read it as we went to them. <laughs> <laughs> you said 16 I said 16-2. 16-2, right. Mr. Speaker. You know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. I'm delighted that the that the that the member of, of Parliament for the reference East Grand Bahama area has found has found his tongue on this issue because this is indeed an, an issue of national importance. I'm delighted that he's now engaged in it. The fundamentals of this deal: who is it with? What is it for? We don't know what it really is because of 16.2. It says essentially that none of what we describe we have to do. No bond's perspective. In other words, can they just do the housing component and hire 10 people and still have a right to lease the 690 acres and still get all the tax breaks? Those are the questions that arise. And why in 17.2 did the government waive its right to eminent domain? The right to compulsory acquisition found in 17.12, sorry. And why does the government relinquish its sovereign immunity in 1713 in any legal proceedings related to the agreement? I wonder if this is also highly unusual. And this is why we need the select committee, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. And we're not trying to ask questions that may be objectionable. We're trying to get to the bottom of the questions that's in the minds of the, of the Bahamian people. And finally, how much will it cost us to extricate the Bahamian people from this deal? I sense, Mr. Speaker, based on commentary by members of the, the cabinet, that we're growing cold on the Oban deal. And my, for my question, ultimately, is how much will it cost to extricate the Bahamian people from this very bad deal? These are questions. The Bahamian people need answers. The people of Exuma want to know. I contend the worst case scenario in this deal was contemplated by Oban from the very beginning. This agreement by its crafters from the very start was well thought out. They are no amateurs, Mr. Speaker. I give it to them. That is why we have loads of questions. That is why we need this committee. 
And this is why we live in a wonderful democracy where any member can stand and call for a select committee. That is why we have a public accounts committee. That is why the majority rules and the minority must be heard. That is why any member has this power to second a motion like this, because we live in a great democracy with checks and balances. That is why the word of the Prime Minister that his own executives will investigate the matter isn't sufficient. This is why there must be checks and balances to keep our wonderful democracy. The investigation, therefore, cannot be self-governed. It cannot be self-regulated, and therefore, this committee is essential. The word of the other side is just not enough. Not when it has thus far been misleading, as I pointed out earlier, and insufficient to make reasonable conclusions. And when the word of the executive can no longer be taken at face value, this parliament has an obligation to act. This is how our sacred democracy works. Mr. Speaker, only the most cynical of governments will claim to be transparent in philosophy, but do not demonstrate it in practicality. Only a government that was never for the people will scream that it has nothing to hide. And when time for the investigative committee to commence, they protest loudly. Why don't thou protest so loudly? <coughs> we will see how committed this government is <coughs> to transparency. We will see how committed this government is to accountability by how it responds to this call for a committee. We will see how committed this government is to the Freedom of Information Act, but how the members on the other side respond to the call for this committee. In any event, Mr. Speaker, if the select committee is not established to secure full transparency for the Bahamian people, I've previously committed that I will ask the Public Accounts Committee, for which I am a part of, to probe this matter, and I reiterate that commitment today. And, Mr. Speaker, if this parliament, the now vociferous members on the other side, does not support this call on behalf of the Bahamian people for transparency and accountability, I am reliably advised by the best QCs in the Bahamas that there's an avenue for judicial review. And I trust that it will not come to that because this is the People Times government who has committed to act in the best interest, to act in the best interest of the Bahamian people. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I unreservedly, unreservedly, second this motion for a select committee to investigate the Oban Energy's scandal, as it's now become known. The Bahamian people deserve to hear the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And Mr. Speaker, today, I recommit to explore all avenues available to the Bahamian people to get answers to the many, many questions that we raise today. And that is a promise. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. On behalf of the fearless people of Exuma, Exuma Keys, and Ragged Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I reserve the balance of my time. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Member. It, honorable Members, it, it, has, it has been moved and seconded for the appointment of a select committee to examine all matters related to the proposed Oban project to review the circumstances with regard to the signing of the heads of agreement and to review 
and inquire into whether the tabling of the agreement dated the 19th of February 2018 constitutes an intentional misleading of the House with powers to send for persons and papers, with leave to sit from place to place, and with leave to sit during the recess. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. As many. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Yamakraw. Mr. Speaker, on the 19th day of March 2018, the Honorable Dr. Humbert A. Minnis, Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and Member of Parliament for Kalani, in reference to the Oban project, said in his communications to this Honorable House, and I quote, the Grand Bahama project must go hand in hand with the protection of our environment and the conservation of our natural resources. Accordingly, the government will do, and might I say, and is doing, a more co comprehensive review of this matter. This review will include our due diligence process at BIA and all environmental and land uses issues, including laws relating to environmental impact assessment and consultation processes, including by residents of Grand Bahama, in particular, East Grand Bahama and others. The government has appointed a cabinet subcommittee to review the heads of agreement with Oban Energies LLC. The cabinet subcommittee is co-chaired by Senator the Honorable Dion Folks, the Minister of Labor, and Mr. Desmond Bannister, the member of Carmichael and Minister of Works. Other members of the subcommittee are the member of South Beach and Minister of Education, Mr. Jeffrey Lloyd, the Minister of, the Minister of Elizabeth and Minister of Health, Dr. Duane Sands, the member of Marathon and Minister of, of the Environment, Mr. Ferreira, the member, the member for Marco City and Minister of Youth, Sports and Culture, Mr. Michael Pindad and I, member for Yamacraw. In addition to the Cabinet Subcommittee, there has also been appointed a technical advisory group comprising of both public servants, private sector professionals, and Mr. Lauren Klein, consultant in the Office of the Attorney General, to advise the subcommittee on matters connected to the protection of the environment, the enhancement of economic benefits and other provisions of the heads of agreement. Mr. Speaker, in accordance with the Prime Minister's statement and Cabinet instructions, the subcommittee has had several meetings with the principals of Oban. And as, and as a member of the subcommittee, I can report that progress is being made. These meetings were conducted in New Providence, Freeport, and at the site in East Grand Bahama, which members of the subcommittee and the technical advisory group toured. Mr. Speaker, it is the position of the government that the appointment of a select committee of this Honorable House of Assembly at this stage would be premature. Accordingly, the government does not support the appointment of a select committee with reference to the heads of agreement between the government and Oban Energies LLC. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your indulgence. Thank you, Honorable Pardon? Member. Honorable members, it has, it has been moved and seconded for, for the appointment of a select committee, and I'll read it again, to examine all matters related to the proposed Oban project, to 
review the circumstances with regard to the signing of the heads of agreement and to review and inquire in, into whether the tabling of the agreement on the 19th of February 2018 constitutes an intentional misleading of the House with powers to send for persons and papers, with leave to sit from place to place, and with leave to sit during the recess. As many as are in favor will remain. The, 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 uh, uh, honorable member, the question is now being put. He doesn't have a right to speak while the question is being put. He should have indicated prior to the question being put. I'm in. The, I'm well in the process. The chair recognizes the honourable member for Cat Island. We, we, we have we have the member from Mango Street who wants to make a contribution to this, and I would like to go. So I don't know. <coughs> 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 So, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Bamboo Town. Mr. Speaker, we have moved on this side that the question be now put. It has been, the other side has had an opportunity. We've given them an opportunity in this place, Mr. Speaker, to speak to the issue of Oban. We have spoken to it on our side, and we do now move that the question be put so that the House can vote on this and we can move forward. It has been moved and seconded, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, honorable members, there is no debate. Once the, once the chair begins to put the question on a matter, there is no debate. I am engaged in the process. The process is, Mr. Speaker, the process has been, first of all, Mr. Speaker, the question has to be put by the floor. No one on the floor, no, there was no question put from the floor. The, 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 the speaker, no, you have, there's no, no questions been put. How could the speaker take it upon himself to put the question? The, 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 the speaker does not put the question. Now, you could move closer to the debate if you wish to lose closer to the debate. That's not a matter. That's not a threat. But you cannot, Mr. Speaker, you cannot off your own just put the question and shut down the debate. It's a matter. That's the, the debate is, is the province of members present. Now, now so the member from Mangrove Key took the floor. Now, if the, it is the, that, the, the, the member from Mangrove Key did not take the floor. He did not take the floor. On the, because because you refuse to recognize it. I asked. Oh, it, it wasn't. Yes, yes, Mr. Speaker. You said, you said, sit down. I, I am. I, I no, I didn't say that, Honorable Member. What did you say, what did you say Mr. Speaker? What I, what I said is, I will. I, I said, I, what I will do was, I would read the question again. And I, and I started the process of reading the entire question okay. again. Right. And no member was on his feet when I started. Right. I indicated to the House that I was going to put the question, and I started to read the question. When I got... Honorable, honorable members, honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the question be now put. debate to be closed so that we can vote on this issue. We've given the other side an opportunity to both move the question and to have a seconder. We have responded to it, Mr. Speaker, and we, the rules also provide for us to ask for the question to be put and for this debate to be closed. And we're doing that, Mr. Speaker. When was it done? Honorable members. I move that the question be now put. I stood up.
and move that the question be now put, Mr. Speaker. We've had a second door on our side. It is on the floor, and we're asked that the debate be closed, Mr. Speaker. And the Speaker started to read it. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the motion for the appointment of a select committee be now put. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Op oppose the motion. I, I've read it t two times. Yes. Honorable, honorable members, honorable, honorable members, the, the motion has been defeated. Hon honorable members, there is no debate on this matter. The question, the motion was put. The motion was the honorable member. Honorable member, the, the the motion was put for the appointment of a select committee. It was it was seconded. On the government side, they made a, a statement. It, it was second. It was the, the motion was seconded by the member for Exomas and Rigard Island. The response on the government side was by the member for Yamakro. Following the member for Yamakro, the chair indicated, and the government leader made motion that the question be now put. The question was put by the, the chair. And the vote was against the selection of a select committee. And so the motion to appoint a select committee has been defeated. Further appointments of select committee. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Centerville. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Um, I too would have given notice for two select committees and when that notice was given, um, I was not sure whether the terms of reference was clear. Before I, I would like to beg your permission, however, to read the terms of references of both the committees just into the record of the House. However, I do intend to defer uh, the motion until after our budget debate. So with your permission, I would like to read the terms of the reference into the, the record of the House. Carry on, on Thank you. Um, the first committee would read as follows, to investigate all matters relative to the phenomena of social media in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, to determine the negative effect, false and up unsubstantiated publications, inappropriate recordings is, is having on the Bahamian society and to make recommendations for the imposition <laughs> of members. legal sanctions to properly compensate. Honorable members, the member for Santa Villa has the floor. Honorable members, honorable members, the member for Santa Villa has the floor. Okay. Continue, so honorable member. Thank you. First committee, to investigate all matters relative to the phenomena of social media in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, to determine the negative effect, faults, and unsubstantiated publications, inappropriate recordings is having on the Bahamian society, and to make recommendations for the imposition of legal sanctions to properly compensate injured parties, and to impose further punitive measures 
for more egregious infractions, especially those with malicious a forethought, mm -hmm. with power to send for persons and papers, with leave to sit from place to place, and with leave to sit during the recess. The second committee reads as follows. To investigate all matters relative to the natural resources of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas above, on, or below to the, the terrain and or sea, to identify the sources of the natural resources that contribute to the Sovereign Wealth Fund, as well as entities, historical and current, engaged in extractions, identify areas of disbursements, recommend to Parliament mechanisms to enhance accountability and transparency in awarding contracts for exploration and extraction and receipt of disbursements, and to consider and suggest the best ways to ensure that the birthright of every Bahamian is legally protected, with powers to send for persons and papers, with leave to sit from place to place, and with leave to sit during the recess. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. The, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Ron Pins and Salvador. I'll be remiss, and I uh, to point out the error of our way. And I refer you to Rule 36 of the Rules of this House, page 31. Just, to, just so I can indicate, as I indicated when I started to attempt to correct our ways, that the government voted against their own motion. And the member for Mangosu ought to, for Mangosu ought to be allowed to speak. Because I said to this House that no motion had been put. They said yes, it had been put. And the leader of the House said that the question be now put. But we let the, that is the first motion you're supposed to vote for. If that motion is carried, then you go <coughs> to the then you go to the main question, right? That's um, thirty six two. You, you didn't listen to me, <coughs> right? It did not. So it's they voted. The they voted it's against. The the they voted it's against their own motion. It's a part of the it's first of all, the motion that was put that the question be now put. Just read it. The question be now put. That was put by the leader of government business. It is said to have been seconded by the deputy speaker. The next question is, rule two says, if the motion for closure, that's what I'm saying, the motion for closure is carried, right? The debate then before the house shall cease, and the question before the house shall be put. The question before the house was the select committee, not the closure. He didn't vote, you all voted against the motion. He voted. <laughs> Watch what you did. Honorable, just before. That's the only vote we had. That's the only vote you had. One vote. You only had one vote, Mr. Speaker. The only. The, on let, 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 I mean, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Bamboo Town. I first stood to my feet and asked the speaker to put the question of whether or not we were going to approve a select committee. That was the first question. The member then spoke to the fact that he wanted the debate to continue. I got up again and said that we should put the motion, the question, to, to decide whether we would accept the select committee. And upon doing so, the debate would be closed because you would have put the question. That is what we voted on, Mr. Speaker. Oh. I said we did. I was attempting to correct it, but we did it because we participated in the vote. We should have abstained, but we participated in the vote by saying we didn't agree with closure. He moved closure. We supposed to have voted on that. And go. And that's a, it's an error. Man. <laughs> so, what, what is the issue then before the House? The, the chair recognizes the honorable member for yeah. Carmichael. Speak as I may assist. Uh, the leader opposite has mistaken his interpretation of Rule 36. Rule 36 speaks to the substantive motion being put. And the only question that one would vote for when you're putting it 
it is a standard motion. Yeah. That's what the rules speak to. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. so, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Let, let him speak. Let him speak. No, no, no. Honorable member for. Why are, you, why are you interrupting me? Why are you interrupting me? Okay. Let's move on, then, then let's move for adjournment. Move us through the agenda then. Move. Speaker, 36 refers to the substantive motion. Exactly. And that is, that is the motion that we voted on. So there's no error, Mr. Speaker. Why you? Honourable members, we we move on the order of business. Instructions, instructions to select committee. Discharge of select committees. Notices for future meetings. Honorable members, notices for future meetings. Um, on, on, honorable member for, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Mangrove Fee South and Central Andros. Speaker, I guess this will be the only time I'll have a voice today in this honorable place. <laughs> um, Mr. Speaker, I would say that all <laughs> notices standing in the name of Her Majesty's Honorable Jink remain. Thank you. Thank you, honorable member. Chair recognizes the honorable member for Bamboo Town. Mr. Speaker, I renew all matters in the name of the government of the Bahamas. And Mr. Speaker, I do move that the House adjourns until 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 30th of May, 2018. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it, it has been moved and seconded. Uh, is, there, is there a second, the first of all? And then on Wednesday, that the Minister of Finance will come with the budget communique. And we will put the member for East Grand Bahama, and we will begin the budget debate in earnest a week after that. Honorable member, the date of the adjournment is the 29th, Wednesday the 29th? The 30th. The 30th? The 30th. Is there a second, though? It has been moved and seconded that the business of this house adjourn to 10 a.m. The 38th of May, 2018. As many as in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Final adjournment. Mr. Speaker, I do now move that the House adjourns. <laughs> it has been moved and seconded that the business of this House adjourn to the 30th of May, 2018 at 10 a.m.